Uh, before we begin, I want to say uh, uh, one very quick thing, and that is to welcome our newest board member seated all the way to my right, and that's Emory Young. Mr. Young, we welcome you. And now I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to be led by Ella Washington. We'll then remain standing for a moment of silence. And I ask that you particularly uh, remember Harry uh, Buckheister, who, was, uh, who died on July 21. And he was a longtime principal at Lansdowne, as well as uh, Aji Lawrence, a 14-year-old Baltimore County School student who died this last week in the terrible storm. First on our agenda is to consider any additions or changes. Mrs. White, are there changes or additions? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to recommend that we pull item E from tonight's agenda. Uh, is there a, a second? Second. Okay, I, I guess is that a motion from you? Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And are there any opposed? Uh, the motion carries. Item E is removed from the agenda. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda, uh, agenda is the uh, selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Uh, the completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right. And our student member is going to draw the names and give them to Mr. Virch, who is going to read the 10 names. <clears throat> Nancy Dimitriades, Daniel Duncan, Christina Panousis. Diana Bergman. Andrew Broadwater. Blank. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good, thank you. Next on our agenda is the superintendent's report, and I invite Ms. White to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I've had the opportunity to visit many of our offices and schools this summer to discuss and focus on literacy and climate for the upcoming school year. And I appreciate hearing directly from educators and teachers and parents about um, supporting literacy across the subject areas and promoting positive school climates that will help all of our learners to succeed. So in terms of celebrating our staff, I just want to bring some things to uh, the forefront that we are incredibly proud proud of. This summer, BCPS has been recognized with multiple national awards that speak to the talent and dedication of our staff um, in support of our students and in our schools. So for the second time, BCPS received the Digital Content and Curriculum Award from the Dig Center for Digital Education and the International Society for Technology and Education. This year's award noted the supportive and protective aspects of our Growing Up Digital website and our Growing Up Digital program. For the 18th year, BCPS was awarded a Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting from the Association of School Business Officials for meeting or exceeding high standards in financial management. For the 21st year, consecutive year, 
the controller's office received the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Finance, uh, Financial Reporting from the Government Finance Officers Association for the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. In addition, the National School Public Relations Association awarded BCPS seven awards for traditional and digital communication, including our blog, our e-newsletter, our the Team BCPS Day campaign, and several publications. And the National Association for School Resource Officers presented Regional Exceptional Service Awards to Officer Timothy Fiedler from Towson High School and Officer Gregory Suber from Lock Raven Technical High School. So I would like to thank the staff across the organization for all of their hard work, and I would ask that we give our staff a round of applause for those, for those recognition. With regard to SAT, as we have continued to increase our SAT participation, our scores have also increased, which speaks to equity and access on this key college gatekeeper. In 2017, the grade 11 SAT participation rate surged to 88%, which was up from 38% in the 2011-2012 school year. From 2016 to 2017, grade 11 scores increased on the evidence-based reading and writing section and the math section of the essay. So again, a lot to be proud of. With regard to Back to School Involves You Too, in close collaboration with the Education Foundation of Baltimore County, of the Baltimore County Public Schools, BCPS has launched the fourth year of the Back to School Involves You Too campaign. It's created to bring the entire community together to support the start of the school year. And this year's campaign has attracted record business participation in the school supply drive. The campaign also includes an opportunity for teachers to select school supplies for their students, the Back to School Festival at Boscov's, the BCPS Day at Camden Yards, and Early Entry Day for rising grade six and grade nine students, and a social media campaign on the first day using the hashtag back to, um, hashtag back to BCPS. And again, it's been a really busy summer. Leaders and staff have been busy this summer preparing for the next school year through professional learning opportunities, curriculum writing, school progress planning, uh, school progress planning boot camps, the EYLP or extended uh, year learning program. About 3,000 students took part in EYLP this year, accelerating or recovering credits at the high school level and strengthening their reading and math skills at the elementary and middle school level. Levels. About 70 high school students work to complete graduation requirements, and so we'll have the opportunity to celebrate their hard work at the summer graduation ceremony that's coming up in a couple of weeks. Later this month, I look forward to addressing the system and school leaders at the administrative and supervisory meeting and welcoming back our 10-month employees as well. And as Mr. Gillis suggested, uh, we, do, we have suffered some loss over the past week that I would like to acknowledge. I think it's important for the family support them. Last week, BCPS lost three students to unforeseen tragedy. A 13-year-old student who attended Middle River Middle School, a 14-year-old student who attended Cockeysville Middle School, and an early graduate who attended Lock Raven High School. Our thoughts and our prayers are with the parents and with those communities as well. <coughs> That's my report, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. White. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, my report. I want to again uh, welcome Emory Young uh, to uh, the board. I know that uh, the new face and the new energy and the new perspective uh, is welcomed by all of us. Uh, so we look forward to working with you. Um, uh, the board is fresh off of its retreat uh, and I think it was successful. We're looking forward to uh, doing our work supporting Team BCPS in the year to come. Uh, it is only one month, four weeks exactly today, until school starts again. We hope that all the uh, teachers and staff are uh, taking advantage of a little respite time uh, and that uh, everyone is uh, recharged for September 5th. Um, uh, next on our agenda is Josie Schaefer, our student board member. Good evening and happy Tuesday. First, I would like to welcome Mr. Young to the board. I'm extremely excited to work with him and I look forward to his crucial input on matters that come to the board. I would also like to thank the teachers that dedicated their July to create and improve on curriculum. 
I was able to visit the teachers on the 18th, and I luckily ran into Miss Megan Shea as I walked into the building, and she was kind enough to show me around the different classrooms, introducing introducing me to teachers and new programs being offered in various schools. It was a great opportunity to see the teachers behind the worksheets that I get in class in action. It was clear that these teachers are passionate about ensuring the best work for our students in the county and I'm grateful that I was able to meet with them. Um, some housekeeping, as we have less than exactly a month until four weeks until school starts, I encourage students to check their school's websites to see if they have any summer homework. Also, the common application is now available for my seniors uh, for the 2017-18 school year. It's a great idea to get a head start filling out the applications and asking your teachers and counselors for letters of recommendation on Naviance before they get swarmed in the beginning of the year. Um, the college process is extremely stressful, and I hope that my fellow seniors know that they can reach out to their teachers if they need help on essays or any other support that they need. Finally, on the calendar for this week, tomorrow I will be attending my first ever Maryland Association of Student Councils meeting, and then on Thursday I'll be traveling to Annapolis to meet with the other SMOBs. With these two events, I look forward to meeting powerful student leaders from all over the state and having the opportunity to hear from hear how different counties operate and take valuable skills back to Baltimore. Thank you, Josie. Once again, a reflection of the great talent we have in our school system to have a wonderful board member like Josie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, next on our agenda uh, is uh, public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice from community members. Uh, the members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we, we, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board, uh, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to education in Baltimore County. Uh, I ask you to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Uh, the first uh, speakers are the advisory and stakeholder group speakers, uh, and the first one in that list is TABCO's representative, Abby Baton. Ms. Baton. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, and members of the board. I hope everyone has had the opportunity to take some time off this summer. This is the time to recharge our internal batteries, as well as have a little fun. I would like to welcome our newest board member, Emery Young, tonight. Emery has always been an advocate for our schools and an excellent choice to become a member of our school board. I look forward to working with him in the future. Thank you. Welcome. In reading over the STAT evaluation report, it seemed to be fair and balanced and in line with much that I hear surrounding the initiatives. I hear positive reactions from many of the teachers as well as some negative aspects. I hear more negative reactions, however, from those who are not now currently involved in the STAT program. What I hear the most about the concerns mirror the last paragraph in the executive summary in the same order. The fact that our STAT teacher's roles look different from school to school is problematic. When the STAT teacher serves as a quasi-administrator, which is in the case in some schools, the staff loses confidence in the STAT teacher's ability to be impartial with the staff. The speed in which change has been implemented for teachers has left many without the necessary time to process the information and plan and make it the their own effectively. And finally, the policies and procedures to address the student issues surrounding discipline, especially around technology, need to be thoughtfully planned and executed. To that end, the TAPCO Discipline Committee is almost finished with its draft document to help guide the work surrounding discipline issues. We look forward to working with BCPS to construct a policy that will be fair and equitable as well as solutions to help schools work on their specific needs to address discipline issues. This cannot be a one-size-fits-all approach to these problems, but guidelines to help each school to manage behavior more effectively. The Kerwin Commission held a meeting at the end of July and community schools was a topic on their agenda. I had the honor of serving on the panel that made the presentation to the commission. It seemed to be well received and we are hopeful the commission will include funding for community schools in their uh, project. Jill Savage, our community schools coordinator, also testified during the public comments section and her testimony was very 
Finally, we are reinvigorated to be working with Ms. White, and I look forward to seeing you in a couple of days. We're meeting in a collaborative manner to help our schools move from good to great. Thanks, and let's have a great school year. Thank you, Ed. Our next speaker is a representative from the PTA Council of Baltimore County, and that's Jane Lee. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, board members. I'm Jane Lee, and I'm the first vice president of the PTA Council of Baltimore County. First, I wish to congratulate Emery on his appointment to the, uh, to the board and on doing something no one has ever done in 22 years, putting me in the position of being at the head. <clears throat> I have been president, un I have been vice president under 10 presidents and never <laughs> stepped up. <laughs> we will miss you on the board, but we look forward to continuing to work with you as we strive to better the lives of all of our children in Baltimore County. It is August, and so our local PTAs are setting goals, making budgets, filling vacancies, and hitting the ground running. We at the council will do the same. In the seven hours since I took on this position, <laughs> I have had 250 emails, numerous calls, <laughs> Facebook messages, and people stopping me to discuss everything from equity in both building facilities and educational opportunities, the STAT report, and its findings that appear to many to show equal levels of academic approval regardless of whether a school was a lighthouse school or not, the wellness policy as it pertains to screen time and most importantly to my board members sleep deprivation which has not been adequately put forward to you and done about something about. That is a national PTA concern and national PTA has a position on that. We will talk about it later. Uh, restraint policies, childhood hunger. We will be addressing each of these items as we move into our first meeting and then we will be coming back to you in the coming days, weeks and months. We are hoping that Ms. White will revert to the old practice of having regular meetings with the council representatives so we can address these issues and then take the answers back to membership. We, of course, would give you our questions ahead of time, meet with you and have answers. We also ask to have an open line of communication both ways so that we know what's coming and we can have answers for our membership. We also hope that we will be placed on with a representative on the various focus groups and committees that parents are on since we are the largest and oldest p parent advocacy group. We also look forward to participating in the nominating commission and the superintendent search as appropriate. Lastly, this past year we started a program that we worked with BCPS with the <laughs> Public Library and with TABCO, an early learning initiative. We hope to go forward with that. I am meeting with Sue Han, and we hope that that's only the first program that we work together on this coming year. It is a year of change, and we look forward to meeting any and all challenges before us. And Mr. Young, you have 14 days to turn over all your things that own that are belong to the council. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have them tomorrow. <laughs> our, our next speaker is a representative from Kate. And that's Tom DeHart. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Superintendent White, and members of the board. I would like to share with you tonight uh, two very important documents. First is the professional standards for instructional or educational leaders, known as the PSELs. These 10 standards were recently adopted into COMAR by the Maryland State Board of Education and replaced the former Maryland Instructional Leadership Framework and the ISLIC standards. The PSEL standards will be the foundation uh, for professional competencies, that component on the state model for the principal evaluation beginning in the 2018-19 school year. These standards apply to principals, assistant principals, and to district leaders as they engage in similar domains of work as school leaders. At your last meeting, I spoke of the significant impact that leadership has on student learning. In all realms of their work, educational leaders must focus on how they are promoting the learning, development, and well-being of each student. The PSELs reflect interdependent domains, qualities, and values of leadership work that research and practice suggest are integral to student success. The companion document uh, to the PSELs 
<clears throat> pardon me, is the model principal supervisor professional standards. These voluntary standards address the need for supporting current principals so they are equipped with, uh, with necessary knowledge and skills to be instructional leaders. Principal supervisors are positioned to provide that support. Traditionally, principal supervisors have focused on ensuring that school leaders and the buildings they run comply with local policies and state regulations. Recent research suggests that principal supervisors can positively affect student results by helping principals grow as instructional leaders. A recent Wallace Foundation report asked if principal supervisors shift from overseeing compliance to sharpening principals' instructional leadership capabilities, and if they were provided with the right training and support, would this improve the effectiveness with whom they work? This question informed the development of the supervisor standards. The shift from compliance monitor to coach is the foundation of the standards. They maintain a focus on student learning through the ongoing development and evolution of the principal's skills. This is done through a district lens, but with one-on-one -on -one principal and supervisor uh, interactions involving an open and honest communication and discussions with targeted goal setting, and supportive professional development. I'll be speaking with the executive leadership in the future about how CASE might collaborate to prepare our district for the PSELs, as well as how principals and supervisors can continue to aspire to the 21st century concept of continuous improvement versus a compliance mentality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. DeHart. Our next speaker is an Area Education Advisory Council representative from the Northeast, and that's Lily Lee. Lee. Dear BOE members, good afternoon. At the end of the new school year, I'm delivering the demands from stakeholders of Northeast Area Education Advisory Council. One is resume the admission criteria for middle school magnet programs in immediately and get rid of the current lottery system. It's specifically referring to the BCPS executive summary for the magnet task force, page 14. Community feedback was clearly stated as only wanting the use of admission criteria with no lottery for middle school, while the complete opposite was done. Baltimore County Middle School Magnet Program should be called lottery program instead of magnet program. To be clear, the only reason why BCPS eliminated the original well work admission criteria and instead adopted the lottery system to my opinion, as well as our stakeholders, is simply for the convenience of BCPS administration. Middle school kids are not little kids anymore. A lot of them already had the talents, built up the motivation, and started to work hard in elementary schools toward the programs they really liked. BCPS didn't attempt to encourage and reward the talents, hard work, and the motivation of those kids by changing to the lottery system. Resuming the admission criteria for middle school magnet is a must immediately to engage our kids with positive things to look upon to. A second demand from our stakeholders is discipline bad behaviors at school. The complete lack of expectations of behavior and discipline at school is a problem. It is a problem when the students who break handbook they are told to sign get no consequences. It sets a bad tone. The teachers' hands are, are tired when they are not supported as well as the administration. Suspicions are there for a reason. Stop looking at the behavior as data report and think of students within that school, those classrooms. When you pull back the line, you draw the behaviors worse. Spoiling love with no consequences is not love at all. It's just jeopardizing the safety of other law-abiding kids, punishing the students of de self-defense the same way as repeat offender bodies is totally not acceptable, especially at the middle school and high school, as kids are old enough to know what they are doing, and it's only rewarding bodies. Thank you so much, Northeast Council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the board is always pleased when a local elected official uh, joins us, and tonight we're pleased that our councilman from the third district, uh, Wade Catch, is here. Councilman. Thank you. I 
appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, this evening. I, I uh, did hear the uh, president of the PTAs talking about her 250 emails when she arrived uh, in office, and actually, that's a good thing because that means the public is involved in the system. So that's a very good uh, thing, and, and you know, so anyhow. And secondly, I don't know who it was that brought up the fact that uh, four weeks and four days from now, the school year is gonna begin, but I can remember when I taught math in Baltimore County, and we would get out of school toward the end of June, and then by July 1, they'd have all these ads, back to school, back to school, back to school. So uh, uh, it, it brought back, uh, memories of that. Uh, I'm here today on behalf of uh, the students in Baltimore County, more specifically uh, Delaney, Towson High Schools, uh, and other schools in Baltimore County that I am hearing are, uh, some of the parents aren't very happy with maybe some of the improvements that have been made to the schools because they're concerned that uh, these improvements uh, are going to put their schools on a list for future additions or improvements, uh, going to put them on the list way down. So uh, a case example would be Towson High School. You know, it was remodeled about 20 years ago. and. Uh, it's in terrible shape today. So I look at that as good money after bad, and I, I don't want to see this board uh, with a policy of, of spending good money after bad. So I'm here on behalf of Delaney and Towson uh, asking you when you uh, consider uh, the uh, capital budget for the county schools that you will add money, planning money, for both of the schools. You know that uh, spending capital budgets are all a matter of priority. And to me, this should be a priority of this board. Uh, you will hear from Delaney uh, parents today, uh, hopefully, uh, that, uh, you know, they've been meeting. They've uh, come up with quite an elaborate plan for the school uh, both this coming year and in the future. They're interested in all students in Baltimore County, every single student, and they want each student to have the most effective uh, means of <coughs> education. And uh, all I can tell you is that Delaney does need a new building, Towson does need a new building, and please keep that in mind when you're taking a look at the capital budget. And thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Councilman. Our first uh, public comment speaker is Nancy Dimitriotis. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Nancy Dimitriatis, and I have a son who recently graduated from Mace Chapel Elementary School, who spent the last three th years there since it opened singing the praises of the teachers, mm. his classmates, the amazing opportunities he was given in a 21st century school with its own TV studio, one-to-one -one devices, um, incredible sound systems so that he could perform on stage and be heard. So thank you for providing the community with Mays Chapel. I also have a daughter who is a rising junior at Delaney High School. She comes home to me um, with reports of squirrels falling through the ceiling in the library, a mouse running across her foot in the locker room, no temperature control, brown water. I began my teaching career in Baltimore County Public Schools several years ago. At the time, the motto that uh, the new teachers and all the teachers um, were exposed to and uh, expected to keep in mind was children first. What has happened to that? To the members of the board with degrees in education, do we not remember our basic child development course and studying Maslow? If our children's basic needs aren't met and they do not feel safe, 
how can we possibly expect them to succeed? BCPS has seen fit to provide Delaney's neighboring schools with comfortable spaces for their students to learn and succeed. The inequity is blatant. There is absolutely no greater investment than our children's education. I'm asking Baltimore County to put our children first and put a new school in the fiscal year 2019 budget. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Daniel Duncan. Thank you for your time. Um, my daughter goes to school and uh, um, she was a couple of days late for um, registering for fall sports. Um, I know that's there's time limits and, and I, don't, I don't know if this is a statewide requirement to be registered online. Um, I apologize for missing, um, but it was not just her, there were other students. Um, I don't know the number, but basically they were sent home, you know, heartbroken. And, um, you know, this is, this is sports, this is fall sports. This, this is for kids after school to keep them off the streets. It's good for them um, to, to see them go home heartbroken, be a couple days late, okay, maybe partly my fault for not being online, not paying attention, or hers or my wife's. We, we both work. My daughter also works through the summer. She was working to, she paid for her own, paid for her own shoes, you know. So um, to be a couple days late, I, I don't understand why there's not some leniency there for her and for the other students that, you know, now aren't, aren't going to get to play fall sports. It doesn't seem very fair to me to break kids' hearts. This is not a life lesson. This is breaking kids' hearts just to play sports. This is not academics. If you're late, you're allowed time to maybe make up a report. To, you know, if you're sick and you can't be at school and you get, you're allowed time. But, you know, I don't know if this is a state requirement to be registered online. Um, or normally you signed up and you went to, I mean, uh, tryouts haven't even begun yet. So um, I don't know why there's not a little bit of leniency there for these students since only a few and uh, it breaks my heart and it breaks my daughter's heart and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christina Panosis. Hello and good evening. My name is Christina Panosis and I'm a Delaney alumni. I spent four years at Delaney and three of those I spent advocating for a new school. Tonight, I was going to read off a list of uh, what Delaney needs, but as I started to write it, I realized I've said it all before. Overcrowding, burst pipes, unsound buildings, asbestos, water damage. I'm sure you're aware of the problems at Delaney High School. I was excited earlier this year to learn that we were getting limited renovations, but that doesn't solve all of Delaney's problems. We still have an unsound structure and ancient pipes. That's why we're once again asking for a new school. A new school would last longer and cost less in the long run. And it's not just students and staff who are asking for this. The community as a whole needs a new Delaney. So instead of repeating facts you've already heard, here are some of the things that the community has said. I've gotten all of these off of the uh, Friends of Delaney Facebook commentaries. Unfortunately, I fear, th I fear that these types of mechanical failures are going to continue at an escalated pace because of the age of the school. Simply putting a fresh coat of paint wasn't and isn't what Delaney High School needs and deserves. How embarrassing and sad it must be to have such a great reputation and the current students to say that they go there. This school has become the laughing stock of Baltimore County. Not good. This building isn't fit for prisoners, and yet it's okay for our kids. Wake up Baltimore County before it's too late. Spend money on schools, parks, and rec facilities. And when these start to fail, so do property values and neighborhoods. 
Our kids need a clean and safe place to be educated. These are all from the community. In short, Delaney's shortcomings have become the shortcomings of the community as a whole. I left Delaney thinking that there would be change for the better, that incoming students would have a better learning environment and that our concerns were being heard. It's my hope that in the future, Delaney High School and the community of BCPS will thrive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Diana Bergman. Buenas tardes. Good evening, everybody. Um, esto es lo que usa mi hijo para poder comunicar. Um, this is what my son uses to be able to communicate. So I want to show you guys the importance of communicating. Oops. Um, it's very important that we could communicate with our stakeholders and our parents between BCPS and our parents and how we make communication a lot better. It's the number one thing that we need to be successful moving forward and all the issues that everybody's talking about from discipline, um, our facilities, and how we communicate what's happening and how we get feedback back and forth. Um, earlier it was mentioned by having PTA come back to the round table to have a representative so you could hear the voice of the parents involved in PTA um, in order to communicate better. Um, there's also a form for a special request transfer for Rule 5140 and it, now we have two forms, Form A and Form B. Um, form A does not allow me to communicate back to you an option of a circumstance. So if there's a special circumstance that needs to be approved by a superintendent designee, I don't have the ability as a parent to mark that option because it's not available. So I'm asking to see how we could better communicate from our forms. The big issue for me that's going on is of course with Lansdowne High School. We have a lot of changes coming in that building. Currently the committee works as far as changes and what's going on with Lansdowne High School and the construction of the renovation project and that gets communicated in the school community of Lansdowne High School. Well, my kids are not there yet. I have an eighth grader this year that he's soon to become a Viking for ninth grade next school year. I have two little ones that are on their way over there. I want to be informed as where that progress is going with Lansdowne High School. What are we getting? and who's responsible to communicate that back with us. Another thing that a lot of parents across BCPS wants to know is who gets priority on these facilities as we try to make them equitable county-wide? Who goes first? I could speak for Lansdowne even though I don't have children there in my community. I know our school is sinking into a pond. I keep saying that and it's hot in there. Even when it's so nice and cool, you go in there five minutes, it's like living in Miami when you step out of your AC house or car. It's like phew, sweat all over your face. So please consider on the way we communicate. And don't forget, Lansdowne has a large population of our families that do not speak English as a first language. So that information needs to come out for these families and the language they understand. Thank you. Thank you. Our uh, last speaker is Andra Broadwater. Good evening. I'm Andra Broad. I'm Andra Broadwater. <laughs> that was quick. Okay. <laughs> Good to go. All right. I am here to comment to you this evening on the subject of school start times, and I know I've talked to many of you and for you before. I'm here again. <laughs> this district has the opportunity to start a conversation talking about the importance of sleep on good health, physical and mental health, on student achievement, on attendance, and on athletic performance. Uh, the wellness policy was a great place to put that, um, and you heard about that before. Um, 
I wanted to just bring to your attention a couple of things. As you heard from Ms. Lee, the National PTA had a resolution this summer similar to the one passed by the Baltimore County PTA Council in 2016, encouraging districts to work toward healthy start times, especially for high school and middle school students, to support their physical and mental health, their safety, their academic performance, and their quality of life. Starting in upper elementary school, kids' bodies change big puberty word, right? That changes their brains, it changes their bodies, so they really physically can't fall asleep until about 11 o'clock. They still need, though, about nine hours of sleep a night. Last year, the first regular high school bus pickup was at 6.02 a.m. Magnet schools started even earlier. That makes it impossible for these kids to get the amount of sleep they need to grow and be healthy. Sleep-deprived adolescents are more likely to be obese, have migraines, be depressed, have suicidal tendencies, more likely to carry weapons to school, more likely to get into car accidents as a pedestrian or a driver, and have lower school performance. There was a study that just came out from the Center for American Progress. The report predicts um, what looked at eighth grade NAEP scores in math and predicts that those scores could increase by eight points, which is equivalent to almost a full grade level, if every school included started about an hour later. Let's think a minute how that could affect our park scores. Just one change. Um, another discussion point with considering school start times is often athletics. And I want to make sure you've heard about this trend with uh, college and professional sports teams that integrate sleep as a component of their training program. Individual athletes have credited getting sufficient sleep as a key part of their performance. Those include our own Michael Phelps, Usain Bolt, LeBron James. As you consider what we can do, please include sleep as part of that. Thank you. Hmm. Next on our agenda is item J, and that is policies. And I invite uh, Mr. Virch to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of our board, uh, the Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept uh, the following policies as amended and brought forward by the committee. These po board policies include policy 1240, policy 3200, policy 3209, policy 3310, policy 3330, policy 3620, policy 3640, and policy 5470. These amendments are presented to you on tonight's board agenda as Exhibit I. J. Well, my notes say I, but if you say J, I'm good. <laughs> Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Virch. Uh, do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the Policy Review Committee? So moved. No second is needed. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Virch. Uh, if I just uh, take a liberty with please. regard to um, our last uh, public speaker, um, the idea of school set schedules, which is really what we're sort of what we're talking about with regard to sleep, uh, that was the subject of a, uh, a bit of a conversation today between the general counsel of the board and myself with regard to where the school schedules might actually have fit under this wellness policy. Uh, and I would just direct folks' attention, my fellow colleagues, to uh, standards. That's Roman numeral two, the C part, and it says. The superintendent shall establish guidelines to implement the wellness policy that include, but are not limited to, and we go down to five, involving parents, students, school administrators, and representatives of food and nutrition services, physical education teachers, and school health professionals in the development, review, and revision of the wellness policy. And I think we could all add the words as needed. So uh, the wellness policy is not etched in stone. It is a living, viable, and hopefully at times sleeping document, getting the rest it needs to pr provide wellness to our students. So those are my comments. <laughs> Thank you. Next on our agenda is item K, and that's uh, personnel matters, and I invite Dr. Mayo to come forward.
Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Superintendent White, members of the board. I like board consent for the following personnel matters, terminations, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, and certificated appointments. Is there a motion to adopt uh, K-1 through K-5? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Uh, that brings us to administrative appointments, and for that, I invite Ms. White to take charge. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Chairman Gillis, and members of the board. I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Principal Battle Grove Ele Elementary School, Principal Hollibird Middle School, Principal Logan Elementary School, Principal Timber Grove Elementary School, Assistant Principal Berkshire Elementary School, Assistant Principal Dundalk High School, Assistant Principal Eastern Technical High School, Assistant Principal Milford Mill Academy, Assistant Principal Parkville High School, Assistant Principal Shady Spring Elementary School, Assistant Principal Villa Cresta Elementary School, Assistant Principal Winfield Elementary School, Assistant Principal Woodlawn High School, Deputy General Counsel, Office of Law, ERP Infrastructure Engineer, Department of Administrative Services, Fiscal Officer, Office of the Chief Academic Officer, Interim Senior Executive Director, Division of Curriculum Instruction, Interim Executive Director of Academics, Department of Academics, Specialist, Magnet Programs, Office of Educational Options, Specialist, Strategic Planning, Department of Research Accountability and Assessment, and the Supervisor of Science, Secondary, Office of Science. Wow. <laughs> do, I, do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit L? Then move. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. White. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gillis. And I'd like to uh, uh, present the following um, uh, personnel and uh, matters and present to you those uh, who will be promoted tonight. So when you hear your name, please stand along with your family members to be recognized so that we can celebrate you tonight. Present first Dr. Renard Adams, who will be the new ex interim senior executive director in the Division of Curriculum and Instruction. <laughs> We also have Carlisle Armstrong, who will be the assistant principal of Parkville High School. <laughs> Do you have friends or family here with you tonight? Um, my husband is actually watching on the live stream. He's my daughter, who's 10 months old, and Anna come tonight. But my uh, principal, Maureen Astrid, is here with me. <laughs> Thank you. Scott Audlin, Assistant Principal, Principal Timber Grove Elementary School. Do you have anyone here with you, Scott? I do. I have my wife, my children, and my parents are here. And Mr. Bates also came out to, to support me as well. Way to go. Yeah. Yeah. We also have Jill, Jill Bender, who will be the, the principal of Logan Elementary School. family with you here tonight. Very good. Congratulations. Uh -huh. Recognize Shannon Berger, who will be the assistant principal, Winfield Elementary School. Shannon, do you have anyone here with you tonight? Yes, I have my husband, Nick, and my parents are watching at home. Oh. Very good. <laughs> also, I'd like to uh, recognize Earl Elias, who will be the ERP Infrastructure Engineer for, in the Department of Administrative Services. <laughs> Earl, do you have anyone here with you tonight? Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize Denise Frock, who will be the fiscal officer in the office of the chief academic officer. <laughs> we 
Denise, do you have anyone here with you tonight? Very good. Congratulations. We have uh, Danielle Green, who will be the assistant principal of Dundalk High School. Danielle, do you have anyone here with you tonight? Well, we're all your family. Yeah. <laughs> We'd also like to recognize Virginia Kearns, Principal Hollibird at Middle School. Do you have anyone here with you tonight? We also have Heather Lundy, Assistant Principal, Villa Crest Elementary School. Here you have a cheering section, so tell us who's here with you. Very good, congratulations. I'd like to recognize John Noonan, Assistant Principal, Shady Spring Elementary School. Do you have anyone here with you tonight? Uh, Ken gave you two thumbs up. <laughs> we have Megan Shea, who will be the interim executive director of academics in the Department of Academics. Who do you have here with you? Congratulations, Megan. We also have Stephen Stevens, Assistant Principal, Eastern Technical High School. Do you have anyone here with you tonight? Yes, I'm here with my principal, Michelle Anderson. Very good. Aaliyah Thomas, Assistant Principal, Villa Crest Elementary School. Aaliyah, congratulations. Do you have anyone here with you tonight? Yes, my parents were Cynthia Thomas, my daughter Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Congratulations. Valerie Thomas, Assistant Principal, Milford Mill Academy. <laughs> Valerie, do you have anyone here with you tonight? Congratulations. We also have Theron Washington, Assistant Principal, Woodlawn High School. Congratulations. Who do you have here with you tonight? Yes, I have my wife, Felicia, my daughter, Ella, and my daughter, Ava. Congratulations. We also have to recognize those who are not in attendance. We know that it is uh, vacation time, and we would like to celebrate them as well. Stephen Coles, who will be the Deputy General Counsel, Office of Law. Julie D'Amico, who will be the Supervisor of Science, Secondary, uh, Office of Science. Christy Enriquez, Principal, Battle Grove Ele Elementary School. Michael Godfredson, sp uh, Specialist in Strategic Planning, the Department of Research and Accountability and Assessment. Liberty Grayek, the Specialist in Magnet Programs, Office of Educational Options, and Nicole Wrightson, Assistant Principal, Berkshire Elementary School. Let's give them a round of applause as well. Good job. May we always have this many smiles at school board meetings. <laughs> Congratulations to all. And next on our agenda, item M is uh, contract awards, and I ask uh, Mr. Stort to uh, take a break before you present because it looks like there's going to be some people <laughs> exiting. I'll just say real quickly that Mr. Audlin's father coached me in baseball and Mr. Audlin's wife is the first attention that I received in high school. Nice. <laughs> uh -huh. Way to go, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to do a Spanish class even though I took French and yeah. sat down to answer questions. So.
Congratulations. All right. Should we try to get their attention to... <laughs> All right. Wait <laughs> process. Right along. All right, we're going to ask the rowdies to go out in the hall, please. That was a good representation. All right, Mr. Stewart, it's all yours. All right, well, just as exciting, uh, members of the board, <laughs> the Board's Building and Contracts Committee met earlier this evening. Items M1 through M8 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Do I have a motion to approve M1 through M8? So moved. Uh, no second is necessary. Any discussion? <laughs> All in could favor? I, could I interrupt just to correct? Um, uh oh. Uh -oh. I'm, I, I met with my staff uh -oh. after the Zaris. committee. I'm there was no question. No. <laughs> <laughs> Please go ahead. Shows integrity. Yeah. I, I hate to interject because things were going so well. Um, <laughs> but my, uh, my staff uh, corrected me after our contracts committee meeting. The uh, item number. Uh, uh, four, which uh, is the uh, U.S. communities uh, building and CTE supplies. Um, it's a, a four-year, four-month term with a five-year extension. And um, the U.S. communities contract is a, has an option to renew for five individual years. And um, what my staff had asked us to present to you was the uh, delegating that authority to the staff to renew without coming back to the board. So I just want to clarify that. And so that if the board wishes to just do the five years and have us come back in six, seven, eight, and nine. It is for four yeah. years and four months, and you want us to give you authority to then renew for five individual times. Right, which would be okay. the full 10-year no. term, assuming that U.S. Communities I, doesn't rebid the contract. Very good. Or so let's do it this terminate. way. Let's, let's uh, um, ask for a motion for M1 through M3 and M5 through M8. And then we'll do that number four separately. Is that okay? So that way we don't have to any any um, confusion. So is there a motion on that? So moved. All right. So uh, any discussion on M1 through 3 and M5 through 8? All in favor of those contracts, please say aye. 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 Okay, those carry. Now we have M4, which uh, was presented to the board, uh, I'm sorry, to the committee as a four-year, four-month contract with a five-year extension. Instead, it is presented now as a four-year, four-month contract with five one-year extensions uh, to be um, decided upon by Mr. Saris's office. Is there a motion for that? Is there, is there confusion about that? Yeah. Yeah. What's the confusion? So, uh, uh, I guess the spending authority that we were presented, um, what was the intended duration of that one million two hundred fifty? All ten years, or nine years and four months. Correct. Correct. So instead of one five-year renewal, it is five one-year renewals. So it's just the opportunity for them to renew serially instead of just one time for five years. Mr. Stewart. For sake of clarification, though, there are really two things happening in this request one is for the funding authority itself but two is to actually change the manner in which we extend the contract Correct. so i might just right. encourage additional clarity in the description yeah, going forward i completely agree and i apologize i think that was my misunderstanding and, and my just so we're clear i think the contract itself if we had looked at it is for four years and four months and five one year, one year. renewals yes um, it was Correct. just presented at the contract committee as one five-year renewal. Correct. Okay. Any other questions? Is there a motion on? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Causey. Um, is it possible that we can amend this to make it um, what we conventionally do, which is to um, approve the 
spending authority for the four years, four months, and then the uh, your department will come back after year four if you want to renew. If that's how you choose to do so, yes. If the board wants to do that, we can do that. May I ask a question? Sure. How typical or atypical for this type of contract would such a request be? Uh, typically, um, these consortium, these cooperatives do run five years with a, f with a renewal option. Um, when we do a bid like this, it's going to typically be five years as well. You know, when we do curriculum or technology, it's going to tend to be 10 years. So um, we're, uh, I, I think that that this contract will remain in place for 10 years if we choose to exercise the option, but we don't. We don't have to do it up front. Okay, I'm looking for a motion. I'll make a motion. Mr. Yulefelder. No, and I like the comment. Or actually, when you think about it, it may be better off having five one-year options because if something arises that you want to get out of it, it's much easier just not to renew for whatever years are left. And we're only talking about an average of 100,000 plus a year so we're really not talking about, you know, huge sums of money. And I think uh, Mr. Cyrus's office does an excellent job, and I have full confidence in him to decide at that point in time whether they renew on a year-by-year -year basis. So is your motion to approve to, the four-year, yeah, four four-month, four and five-one-year five five one year options? Very good. Is there a second? Uh, there's no need for a second, I guess. All right. Um, any further discussion on that? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Saris. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Will be around five years. <laughs> Ten years from now. <laughs> Next on our agenda is a report on fiscal year 2019 state capital budget. Uh, and for that, I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Saris to stay. I guess Mr. <laughs> Dixit's going to stay. I'd like to invite Ms. Burnup to join us. <laughs> so, um, Mr. Chair and yes. members of the board, I do present Barb Burnup, George Harris, and Pete Dixon, all of whom you know, uh, to present the capital budget, um, the state capital budget, I should say. And so I just wanted to, uh, before they begin, just to acknowledge all of the emails and the correspondence that I, I have received um, from various stakeholders, particularly those in high schools or have who have high school students right now. and. Um, from various schools, though, some of which you've heard from and others of which you may not have. I'm sure the board has received a lot of uh, emails and calls as well. And having said that, I know that you are preparing. Tonight is just a presentation of the capital budget. There is a work session, as you know, um, at the next board meeting during the August 22nd meeting. And you are in the process, I'm sure, um, particularly after tonight, of formulating your questions for that um, board meeting. So having said that, I thought I would clarify some things up front um, for the board and for uh, the public as well. Uh, the There is an RFI that has been, um, that is on as they say on the street right now, <laughs> so that it's open, so that we can take a look at determining the number of high school seats that we'll need. And so we we know that that RFI is active. It should be closing, if not has closed um, sometime I think soon. So. Yeah. And so that having said that, we do anticipate the need for high school seats. We know that our elementary schools, middle schools will be covered, but we do know that we're going to need high school seats. Therefore, um, I've spoken with the county executive lately, and I just wanted to say that this is the state capital budget that you have in front of you. Um, but I would like to put planning dollars in the county capital budget that will come before you in December. Again, this is the state budget that the staff has done a wonderful job of vetting, prioritizing, based on the data that they have in front of them and based on their expertise. This is the state capital budget. But in terms of planning dollars, the, the county executive and I do agree that we should anticipate the need for high school seats and we'll need to include those planning dollars in the county capital budget. So I wanted to say that up front because I know that you're formulating your questions for August 22nd and I wanted to make sure that we um, make sure that we're comparing apples to apples and that we're uh, giving you the information that you need to formulate your questions for that meeting. And with that I'll turn it over to staff to present the capital budget. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick outline of the process. Um, 
And I guess I'll start by noting that uh, the proposal we've got uh, at 116.7 million obviously exceeds our needs, um, or exceeds the funding available to to us from the state of Maryland. Uh, in the last three years, uh, the state has allocated 38 million, 50.5 million, and 45.2 million. So. Um, we are competing uh, against all 24 LEAs for funding, and nobody's will be fully funded. Um, the process began in April with a very well attended, excuse me, May, with a very well attended public hearing. Uh, the board will vote September 12th on this state request, and we will file a uh, several hundred page document with the interagency. Uh, Committee for Public School Construction. Um, and during the month of November, uh, we will be responding to question, detailed questions on specific projects that comprise our request. And we will have an opportunity to uh, make amendments, uh, appropriate amendments during that time. Uh, on December 7th, the superintendent uh, will uh, make an appeal and an address to the IEC. Uh, and thereafter, approximately 25% of the funding is recommended. Uh, uh, as uh, the superintendent indicated back in December, we'll be back to present the county capital budget, which will, uh, as she mentioned, include uh, some planning funds for additional uh, high school seats. Um, the board will uh, vote on that county uh, pro uh, capital proposal in January, and the superintendent will have another opportunity to appeal to the Board of Public Works in January. And after the state adopts its uh, budget, both operating and capital in April, uh, they will make a final uh, allocation of funds uh, of about 25 percent. I think I missed the 50 percent funding point somewhere along the way here um, in December. Uh, so that's a summary of the process, and Mr. Dixit will go through the uh, priorities that we're presenting here. Thank you, George. Uh, uh, as the superintendent indicated, this is the first uh, draft of the presentation. It is a moving document. It's going to be adjusted. Uh, some of you that were on the board last year, you saw the changes, and we shared those changes periodically with you. The focus of this program continues to be air conditioning, high school renovation, additional elementary and middle school seats, and systemic improvements. The first four priority projects are continuation of the last year's project. It's just that we haven't received all the funding from state, so we have included and they have the top priority. The next uh, 11 priority projects, 5 to 15, were approved by the board in this order last year, and they are being resubmitted. They could not be funded because all the money was not available. The next 10 priority project, which is 16 to 25. The, this is the New Year's priority that we have, that we have developed in consultation with our fiscal authorities and with, with the needs out there and also based on the enrollment projections that we have received from strategic planning. And the final 16, no, the next 10, 16, uh, 26 to 34 are systemic improvements. It is very typical for us to include not only renovation addition and construction, but also take care of the infrastructure needs. So you will see boiler, chiller, and roof replacement projects. Um, thank you, Mr. Sarist and Mr. Dixit. Um, we want to remind board members, as the superintendent did, that to get us any questions that you have so that we can make sure that we would address them in two weeks. So. Thank you for your attention. So, um, yeah, Mr. Smith, Kevin Smith, has, uh, has asked that board members give um, written questions so that the, uh, the staff can have time to prepare to respond to those questions at our work session on, eight, on August 22nd. Um, and um, so 
with the addition of Ms. White's comments uh, at the outset of this. Um, are there any questions about the presentation, knowing that we're going to have questions about the substance on August 22nd? Mrs. Causey. Mr. Chair, thank you. In, in a question of the process, uh, when are the questions, when should they be submitted to Mr. Smith, and then uh, is the board going to receive answers in writing before the meeting or only at the meeting? So Mr. Smith asked me to say that uh, questions uh, should be submitted by the, um, by the end of next week, I, I think August 18th. Uh, but the sooner they get to the, the staff, the better. Um, and um, I think that the plan is to present those responses verbally and not in writing. Then what would be the process for amendments or uh, potential reprioritization of this capital request by board members? Right. So that's our, that's our job after we uh, have our work session uh, before we submit our recommendations to the state. So when is the vote supposed to be? At, please September help me there. 12th. September 12th. Okay, so the board could make changes Absolutely. up to and including September 12th. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, yep. thank you. All right, any further comments? Uh, thank you all for that presentation. Uh, we look forward to um, uh, getting you some questions so we can then have a presentation again on the 22nd during our work session. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda, item O, is the Blueprint 2.0 uh, stat uh, report and I ask uh, Dr. Brown to come forward along with Dr. Morrison and Dr. Ross uh, to present that three year three evaluation report. While they're coming up I will uh, remind the board that uh, the administration's response to the uh, the Johns Hopkins findings uh, will be discussed at the September curriculum committee meeting that's September 14. Um, and so um, after they the, our, uh, our speakers, Dr. Morrison and Dr. Ross, present. We'll have questions to them if there are any. All right, Dr. Brown, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Chair Gillis. Uh, you just iterated about half of what I was going to say. <laughs> um, so, Chair Gillis. You know, the uh, good thing about it is repetition is good. Superintendent White, members of the board and the community, um, pleased again to have the opportunity to introduce our colleagues from the Center for uh, Research and Reform in Education from Johns Hopkins to provide their annual report on the STAT initiative. Um, as Chair Gillis had mentioned, uh, members of our staff, the curriculum staff and others, uh, we'll be presenting uh, the, the staff response uh, to the Johns Hopkins report at an upcoming curriculum committee meeting. That being said, I'm going to get out of the way because this is their show. Thank you. Dr. Ross, we're glad you didn't have traffic this time. <laughs> oh, you, you remembered that. I, I thought you'd forget. Um, <laughs> yes, I left early. Um, it's good to see you all again, um, Superintendent White, Mr. Gillis, members of the board. Um, this is the third year report and um, Dr. Morrison has been the PI of the project and uh, she'll be presenting the PowerPoint and then we'll both be available after the PowerPoint for questions as you have time. So we look forward to having a little bit of dialogue with you about the results. It's all yours. You can talk about the model. So um, for those of you that have heard us, this would be our sixth time, I think. Um, but for those that haven't, we'll go over the evaluation model that we can co-constructed with BCPS. So um, this describes that professional development that's offered to administrators, stat teachers, and then the PD that's then offered to classroom teachers would be expected to have an impact on measurable outcomes, um, particularly in year one and beyond. These measurable outcomes would be the classroom environment, teacher practice, digital content, which could then impact student engagement in year one, as well as 21st century skills, such as creative thinking uh, or critical thinking and creativity and then ultimately an impact in student achievement and um, the ultimate goal of graduating globally competitive students. And we would expect to see an impact on these goals in years three to four and beyond. So our end of year report examined the professional development received from the district in addition to the PD and support received by classroom teachers from stat teachers. We looked at stat teacher roles and best practices, then the impact of PD on measurable outcomes 
and goals, as well as the perceptions of the SAD initiative. We had a variety of qualitative and quantitative data sources for the end of year report. We conducted interviews and focus groups with principals, stat teachers, and classroom teachers within both Lighthouse and Phase Two schools. We administered a teacher survey to all teachers within Lighthouse and Phase Two grades that are participating in staff. We conducted classroom observations in April in Lighthouse schools and Phase Two schools. It ended up being 177 classrooms that were observed for 20 minutes each, which equated to 3,540 minutes of observations. And just so that you know, in the spring of 2015, we conducted an inter-rater look at um, the training that we're providing to our observers and the coefficient was 0.972. So frame of reference, it can range from zero to 1.0 and researchers say 0.7 and up is trustworthy and ours was 0.972. Also, um, our raters, when they did disagree, they went into a classroom and to observe the same classroom and then I looked at the results. Typically, it was only a disagreement by one scale point. So one rater might say um, it extensively occurred, the other one said just one step below that. Then we also looked at student behavioral data, including attendance, office referrals, and suspensions, map assessment data for grades one through three, and then we looked at the parent and student responses to the STAT-specific climate survey that was administered by the district. So first, there are a lot of different schools that are participating in STAT right now, so I made a quick kind of visual for you. Cohort one included Lighthouse grades one through three. They started in 2014-15, so they're now in their third year of STAT. Cohort two included Lighthouse grades K, four, and five, phase two grades one through three, and Lighthouse grade six. So they are presently in their second year of set, or they just would have wrapped up their second year of set. And then last is cohort three, which is phase two grades K, four, five, phase two grade six, Lighthouse seven, and Lighthouse grades nine through 12. So they had just completed their first year of staff. So in a preview of year three results, um, the published research, one of actually one of the um, high quality journals in our field, the Review of Educational Research, found that school district technology integration initiatives um, ultimately result in higher student engagement, increases in student-centered instruction, and improved student achievement. So our results found that we're still seeing continued changes from teacher to student-centered learning, shifts to teacher coaching rather than presenting information, a focus on using data to customize instruction, and then a strong impact on student engagement. So the first area of the logic model that I'll review is um, the professional development. And here we looked at interviews, focus groups, and the teacher survey that solicited perceptions of professional development offered by the district and the stat teacher. So participants discussed a wealth of support and preparation for STAT implementation. Principals conveyed their role was to support and lead the initiative within their school, and most classroom teachers indicated that the principal was effective in their role as it related to STAT implementation. Teachers described encouraging and supportive principals, but some potentially isolated concerns were expressed by teachers who indicated they needed more planning time and assistance with discipline issues. STAT teachers conveyed feeling prepared to serve in their role and supporting classroom teachers. They did request PD pertaining to incorporating technology in the curriculum, small group instruction, behavior management, and guidance on engaging all teachers in their building. As with prior reports, STAT teachers are viewed by classroom teachers as very valuable and critical to the initiative's success. They're an important resource for classroom teachers as they gain further experience with technology integration and changing teacher practices. <coughs> Also consistent with prior reports was the concern that STAT teachers may not be utilized in the manner by which BCPS intends, in addition to inconsistencies with the STAT teacher roles and responsibilities across schools. Overall, classroom teachers conveyed generally feeling prepared and supported for STAT implementation. They did, though, often reference the amount of time needed to plan for technology integration. In terms of future professional development, teachers expressed the need for PD on tools and programs including BCPS1, and some express the need for PD on 21st century skills. So the next area of the evaluation model that we looked at were measurable outcomes. So in order to assess the impact on classroom environment and teacher practice, the observations were conducted in Lighthouse and Phase Two schools, and results of our most recent observations in April were compared with baseline observations. 
Access to digital content was examined through participants' perceptions on technology integration successes and challenges as conveyed through interviews and focus groups as well as our survey. So for those of you that haven't seen it before, we have the OASIS 21 observation instrument. Most items are rated on a five-point scale, and so we, they would be rated on the degree to which the strategy was observed for 20 minutes. So if it happened before the classroom, or before the observer entered the room, it wouldn't be counted, as well as if it happened after. So it's just for the 20 minutes that we were in the classroom. And the scales range from <coughs> not observed all the way to extensively observed, which means it was highly prevalent in the class. So overall in the area of classroom environment, observation results were generally similar in the spring of 2017 with baseline observations for each of the three cohorts. Across the eight subgroups that make up the cohorts, only two subgroups demonstrated significant differences on any items between baseline and most recent observations. But generally, as displayed on the screen, classrooms had information and resources that reflected the content being taught. Less often was information and resources supporting independent thinking displayed that these two materials were more prevalent in cohort one classrooms as compared with cohort three. Cohort ones, in the, again, in their third year, whereas cohort threes in their first year. So across the eight subgroups that make up the cohorts, there were only isolated differences between baseline and the most recent observations, that have, and none were really central to STAT implementation. So overall, there appeared to be little change in that physical environment, but as we would expect, classrooms might get the physical environment in accord with STAT goals, and little change would then be necessary in later years. Then we looked at the impact on teacher practice. So as you can see in the bar charts, across the cohorts, teachers made fairly frequent use of coaching and facilitating, and less frequent use of standing in front of the classroom and presenting information as in a traditional approach. Higher level questioning and higher order instructional feedback were both exhibited somewhat infrequently in the observations, while student-initiated communication was exhibited noticeably more often. The use of flexible grouping was rarely observed in each of the cohorts. As would be expected, given their early experience with STAT, cohort three classrooms tended to exhibit a less noticeable impact on, of the initiative on teacher practice as compared with cohorts one and two that are in their third and second year of implementation. Cohort three teachers did, though, display coaching and facilitating behavior to a similar extent as the other cohorts. So as conveyed through our observations, interviews, focus groups, and the survey items, there has been an impact of STAT on teacher practice. Principals in all groups described mindset changes with their teachers, referencing increased collaboration with peers and more time spent planning. STAT teachers also described increased collaboration among teachers, in addition to teachers continually taking risks with meaningful integration of technology. And then teachers described a change in their practices regarding personalized instruction more frequently and creating more interactive learning for their students. And then the impact on digital content. Classroom teachers in the three cohorts indicated their use of BCPS1 through survey responses. Across all the responses, the most frequent use of BCPS1 was to deliver instruction customized to students' needs, followed by developing assignments. Less often was BCPS1 used for developing formative assessments and posting homework assignments, as displayed on the screen. Responses were fairly consistent across cohorts. The cohort one teachers tended to indicate more frequent use of and develop assignments as compared with teachers in other cohorts. So this might reflect a more um, advanced use of the platform because they're in their third year of implementation. The results from surveys, interviews, and focus groups indicated that all participant groups perceive an improvement in the access to and use of con digital content and resources. In terms of successes with technology integration, principals referenced the use of BCPS1 and programs, particularly in terms of student-conducted research and students having options in how they demonstrate their learning. STAT teachers also mentioned the success of using BCPS1, such as to personalize instruction and encourage student ownership of their learning. Similar principals and STAT teachers, classroom teachers, described their successes with technology integration through their ability to differentiate instruction and provide the opportunities for students to learn at their own pace. Teachers also described the positive impact on student as a success, such as students taking ownership of their learning, improving their technology skills, and some described increased engagement. 
As with the year two report, <laughs> teachers express challenges with technology integration, most notably through frequent reports of off-task or inappropriate use of devices. So while devices bring students access to a wealth of information and resources for learning, teachers struggle with how to ensure that students do not abuse this access by engaging in activities that are inappropriate or not instructional, whether playing games or accessing unacceptable websites. Less frequently mentioned challenges included technical issues and feeling a lack of support, whether through planning time or PD. We also impact, examined the impact of professional development on the second category of measurable outcomes, student engagement for century skills. We expected to see an impact in both cohort one and two schools, given their tenure with SAT implementation, but less of an impact in cohort three, which just started SAT. So a few notable differences were found between spring observations and baseline observations. Most recent observations for student engagement were mostly similar with those gathered at baseline for all three cohorts. Between the cohorts, students generally made fairly frequent use of digital tools for learning. And when devices were used, they were predominantly used by students engaging in independent work. For each of the cohorts, independent work was observed which much, with much greater frequency than collaborative learning or student discussion. While collaborative learning was observed less frequently, this finding does not mean that students were not interacting with one another. It just means that they were not engaging in a formal collaborative assignment, working together towards a common goal. The principals and stat teachers across groups conveyed a positive impact on student engagement. They attributed this improvement to more student-centered and personalized learning. Classroom teachers, though, varied in their perceptions of student engagement. Some felt there was a positive impact, whereas others felt that engagement had waned. Teachers appeared to still be determining how best to integrate technology to engage students, as well as how to encourage collaboration when students are using technology. The perceived impact on student behavior was much more varied between principals, stat teachers, and classroom teachers across grade levels as compared with student engagement. While some viewed a positive improvement, others did not, and a few related behavior issues to device presence and associated distractions. Behavioral data indicated that there were changes in attendance, referrals, and suspensions. While many changes were slight, there were some statistically significant increases in suspension rates. Based on interview and focus group data, attendance, office referrals, and suspension rates may be influenced by changing demographics or other known, unknown factors to a much greater degree than students' reactions to STAT. That is, the extensive principal teacher and STAT teacher reactions generally suggest, with the exception at some schools, improved student engagement and And then observation results for P21 skills were similar between spring 2017 and baseline for all three cohorts. While there was a stronger impact on 20, P21 skills, as might be expected for cohort one classrooms now in their third year, results were comparable across all three districts. Of the four P21 items, the presence of learning that incorporates authentic or real world context was observed the most frequently across each of the cohorts. Less often were teachers observed integrating project-based approaches to instruction and inquiry-based approaches to instruction. The district may consider offering targeted professional development to teachers regarding P21 practices, as well as creating sample lessons that teachers can incorporate to further encourage use of these skills. Though observation results revealed little impact on 21st century skills, classroom teachers, particularly those in cohort one, somewhat agreed that these skills had improved this year. However, principal stat teachers and classroom teachers across all groups conveyed slight or varied impacts on these skills during interviews and focus groups. All generally felt there was more work to be done in developing these skills in students. So as displayed in the logic model, we expect to see an impact on goals, including student achievement in years three and beyond. We examined MAP scores from the pre-program year through the present academic year for both Lighthouse and non-Lighthouse, grades one through three. In addition to the pre-program year, we examined three years of achievement data for Lighthouse one through three and two years for non-Lighthouse one through three. And we were also able to obtain the national average MAP scores from the 2015 administration of the test. Unfortunately, we can't get it for every year. They only do it every few years. So we only have 2015. 
The national norm is comprised from a representative sample drawn from test records from up to 10.2 million public school students across the U.S. So as an overview, for Lighthouse grades one through three, results were consistent for both mathematics and readings. There was an increase in the proportion of students meeting growth expectations each year stat has been implemented. Whereas grades one and two exhibited year-to-year -year gains in average scores, Lighthouse grade three exhibited a decline from year two to year three. But then all three grades ex exceeded the national norm during their second year of stat. And just a reminder that non-Lighthouse grades one through three are in their second year of stat implementation. We would expect to see an impact in year three and beyond. For both mathematics and reading, there was an increase in the proportion of students meeting growth expectations during the two years of STAT. For math, grades one and two exhibited improvements year over year in average scores. Grade three scored almost identically from year one to year two. And then only grade two exceeded the national average score in mathematics. In contrast with math, all three grades exhibited increases in average math scores each year in reading. In addition, all three grades exceeded the national norm. And the last area that we examined were perceptions of STAT. So principals, STAT teachers, and classroom teachers described a variety of strengths of the initiative, such as increases in student engagement, a focus on instruction and student-centered learning, and the variety of options and resources available for teachers to support student learning. Overall, these stakeholders appear to be quite positive towards the initiative, as were parents and students. For example, the vast majority of parents and students were positive towards personalized learning and technology, though elementary school parents tended to be more positive towards teachers' use of technology to meet students' academic needs than some of the other grades. So we offer some recommendations for future years of STAT. First, the roles and responsibilities of STAT teachers still require clearer definitions. Second, many teachers feel that too much is happening too quickly, and consequently, they need more time to digest, plan, and perfect what is already on their plates. In particular, they desire additional support in designing meaningful lessons and in integrating technology to teach higher order skills. Third, strengthening and refining technology policies and operations are suggested to address student off-task or inappropriate behaviors, whether devices can be taken home by students at various grade levels, and technical support needs for different programs and applications. Finally, principals indicated the need for improved communication from the district to schools, and particularly from the district to parents about the initiative and its goals. So in conclusion, we found highly positive perceptions of STAT teachers, as we have with the previous two years of reports. STAT is valued for increases in student engagement, a focus on instruction, and support for learning. STAT is viewed positively by all stakeholders, and there is a positive achievement trends observed on MAP exams. Very Any good. Questions? Thank you, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Morrison. Um, if I may start with just a, a question, uh, and it concerns uh, your slide that talked about uh, the review of educational research and those general comments that you had at the top of that slide about higher student engagement and increases in student-centered instruction and the like, those kind of, I guess, juried results, are they, um, are they over a longer period of time? Are they over three years? Uh, what would you expect or how would you compare what you have seen with the literature that you've seen? <laughs> um, so I, I pulled, besides that article, I've pulled a lot of research on one-to-one -one initiatives and um, generally positive findings. I think like Maine is a notable one. The state of Maine started technology integration, um, one of the earliest states, I think 2001, and found positive trends in student, student achievement and student engagement. But um, there's a <coughs> recent meta-analysis, so that's looking at a, a lot of different studies um, with pretty stringent criteria and examining impacts, and they found positive achievement trends. But. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, generally with the um, success of um, technology integration, it is a three to four to five year process. And, and although we're educational researchers, we know in our hearts and minds that educational research tends to be biased a little bit in the sense that the ones that end up in the literature tend to be more the survivors, the ones that start out um, last the year, superintendent changes, funding changes, it disappears. They don't appear in the literature. 
So um, what you're showing after three years is actually um, above the schedule that we all talked about that first year. We were expecting to see some upticks in learning in year four, maybe year three. We're seeing it now. The MAP results, by and large, are very good. Very good. Other questions? Mrs. Eaton. Were the teachers made aware that they were going to be observed on a certain day at a certain time? So we did. The, the process that we employed for doing this, because we know, it, you know it's hard with schools because they all have schedules and field trips and things like that. So we requested for principals to select a date. And so they knew the date that we were coming. They did not know the classrooms that we would observe, um, the time that we would be there. We randomly selected the classrooms that we visited. And did the teachers hand in a formal lesson plan to the observers? Mm -mm. No. Okay, and um, last year I brought this up too, and you stated it again this year that they need to write um, defined roles for the stat teachers. And I brought it up last year, so I was just wondering, Ms. White, why a year later are the stat teachers still um, having concerns about their duties? Yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Eden. That is something that we're learning from this report and that we've continued to hear. And, and again, it is a point of frustration and that we know that we have to be very vigilant when it comes to making sure that stat teachers, as well as our other um, teachers who are supervising or who are uh, reporting to uh, staff or who are supporting teachers in general, department chairman, other roles that they clearly know. Again, there is um, kind of a a mixing of roles when it comes to support, coaching, and uh, that level of guidance. Fortunately, we have several roles that do that, but the stat teacher's role has to be clearly defined rather than just kind of other duties as assigned. And that really requires our communication, better communication from us to our principals. And so uh, we have many, many principals, most of whom do this very well, but as we're hearing from the report, we still have more work to do. Okay, thank you. Sure. Other questions? Well, thank you very much. Uh, oh, <laughs> Mr. <Yoko. laughs> yeah, I, I was just thinking, but I don't know whether you can answer the question. Um, I, I've visited many classrooms with, it's, with um, digital learning. And in talking to the teachers, uh, they've expressed to me um, how much positive behavior there's been, uh, and I said this last year, relative to students having a device uh, and being more engaged, and how many, in fact, some numbers they were giving me, how many less office referrals they have, and yet and that's data that we, could, uh, that we could pick up within the schools. I'm not sure about the suspension, and I think what you said relative to perhaps uh, where the suspensions are occurring and what schools and so forth and so on has to be analyzed, and then, then pull in whether STAT has any uh, effect on that one way or the other. But I'm just a bit surprised of all the teachers I've talked to how positive they are about the behavioral factor. And, of course, they can't, can't quantify it in terms of a graph, but we certainly can quantify it in terms of less office referrals or, or less suspensions in those schools that have the, everybody has the device. Yes, um, usually, you know, as we all know, um, particularly people who have um, been teachers before, when students are engaged and they're occupied, um, they tend to misbehave less. Uh, what we've seen with three cohorts, because we've actually had three replication studies, stat kicks in pretty fast. Like once the teachers receive the professional development, you have a lot of um, student-centered learning where students are doing individualized learning. You have a little bit less teacher lecture. You have a lot of use of digital devices. So for the most part, kids are engaged. Suspensions are a very rough measure. To, of course, to be suspended, that's more than talking to your neighbor. That has something to do with what kids are in your school. Um, uh, cert certain, and it's also a very, very small percentage of the kids in the school. So you can see an uptick in, in suspensions that has nothing to do with STAT because it is kind of a rough measure. It's not a sensitive measure. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Go ahead, Ms. Young. You speak of the inappropriate off-task use. How is that being determined? I know you said you go in there and you observe them for 20 minutes, but I'm assuming that's not um, you interrupting them. It's just watching. And 
also with that, you know, how much of that is going on within the classrooms? So the reports of inappropriate off-task use um, actually didn't come from observations. Those came from survey results. So we administered a survey to uh, all Lighthouse and Phase two grades that were participating and asked the teachers, to what extent are you observing inappropriate off-task use of devices? And then they rated from not at all to extensively. And then we prompted them if they at least said occasionally, we asked them to describe what sorts of issues are you encountering. So that's where that data source came from, not from observations. And it was an anonymous survey? Yes, it was. Okay. Ms. Schaefer. Uh, I was wondering if there is a way to confirm that professional development that stat teachers take trickles down to the students. Um, I'm in a lighthouse school, and it's been really cool. I'm cohort three at, uh, <laughs> at Pixel. It's been really cool. Like, I enjoy my device. Um, but I was wondering if there's ways we can confirm that, like, the programs that the stat teachers are learning are being implemented in schools, especially, like, the 21st century learning. Like, um, a teacher would be, like, to he would say, take out your device and go on Sway, make a project, and then we'll um, present it. But um, no one taught us how to use Sway. No one's taught us to use like all these device, all these applications that are on our device, and there's so many. Like if you just scroll through, but no one's um, shown us how to use them. No one showed us the appropriate time to use them. So I was just seeing if there was a way we can confirm that. Right. You know, I a few points come to mind. Um, so we talked to teachers to to ask them. You know, like what was the professional development that you received primarily from your SAT teacher, um, and it was pretty positive. Um, I think this year I felt like the stat teachers and the classroom teachers were a little more reflective in saying mm -hmm. we need PD on 21st century skills. We need PD on small group use of technology, which we hadn't heard before. We just made the observation of when kids are using devices, it's independent. And then they brought to us, we need PD on small group use. So I think, I think stat teachers and classroom teachers are becoming more aware of the PD that they need, and they're starting to vocalize that. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, I don't, you know, besides asking classroom teachers, you know, have you been prepared? That's our main source. Thank you. Mm -hmm. When we um, <coughs> do the observations, we look at the 21st century skills, the inquiry, use of real world events, um, use of projects. What we see with all three cohorts is as soon as that starts, you get a certain level, but then it doesn't change in frequency very much. and. I think what that's showing, in addition to the teacher's qualitative reports, is they want a little more. It's very hard to teach a lesson integrating technology using projects, and a lot of them are not quite sure how to go beyond what they started with. And so there's probably some ideas we could share with the curriculum committee when we have those kind of meetings of how we can go further. Now, I'm sure the projects are getting better in quality. We don't evaluate that, though. We come in for 20 minutes and we check to see what's being done. But maybe some more sharing of the really good lessons between teachers would really help those that aren't aboard to see that they can do it too. Mr. Stewart? So I think this does dovetail into that discussion, but the, uh, my question is really, you know, how disconcerting and how concerned are we regarding the impact on 21, P21 skills and uh, the way that we're approaching this? Is it really just a matter of professional development? Is it about substantive curricula writing and incorporating the right materials into the devices and to the instruction itself? It seems like a significant gap that we're going to need to address going forward. I mean, we've, we've talked before about how challenging it is to design lessons, such as inquiry-based approaches to instruction and project-based approach to instructions, um, and we don't see it often in the classrooms because it is a challenge for teachers to do that. Um, in one of the focus groups that I conducted with teachers, it was a really interesting, but it felt like a pocket isolated of teachers who were really creative and were volunteering examples of what they'd, what they'd done in terms of project-based approaches, but they also recognized how hard it was for them to implement that lesson. So I think more support from the curriculum office is really what's, what the teachers need. And there also needs to be the right mix, like projects and inquiry are great ways of teaching critical thinking, problem solving skills, but they're not efficient for teaching common core state standards in the sense of all the math 
um, concepts you need to learn. So a good mixture of different types of instructional approaches is probably the right way, and that's different for every teacher. Is that kind of symptomatic of us being pulled in lots of directions as far as measuring academic outcomes? Yeah, there's different levels of academic outcomes, and if all you did as a teacher all day was projects, would the kids learn all the different skills they need to learn and are tested on? They might, you know, if you were really an excellent teacher, but mixing pedagogy. So it's not a matter that you're better if you're doing more 21st century. Right, so uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but before I lose the question, what's your level of confidence that we'll be able to provide adequate professional development that basically crosses all these multiple metrics that you're talking about or academic performance goals that we have here? <clears throat> Based on what we've seen with the first three years, we have every confidence you can do it if the curriculum committee and the people who um, work with professional development um, take what you have as a foundation, which is very strong, and run with it. Um, you know, I think there's some ideas we can share. One of the common problems across the country with project-based learning, 21st century skills, is teachers that don't naturally take to it, don't know what a good lesson looks like. And there's different means of professional development with like lesson study, where teachers share good lessons. So I think you're off to a good foundation. It sounds like the next step would be, how do we get into the classrooms? Not so much more, but high quality 21st century skills, projects, inquiry, and all of that. So I think you can do it. You've made tremendous progress the first three years with STAT, with all three cohorts. Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I share my colleague, Mr. Young's, concerns about time spent um, off task, and we frequently hear from stakeholders that that's their concern as well. I'm curious to know how you determine the observation window of 20 minutes and the validity of that um, measurement period and why that was chosen. Um, I'm concerned that had you spent 60 minutes observing, would we have found that 40 minutes were off task versus 20 minutes engaged? Could you speak to that? We don't have those kind of capabilities as researchers. Um, we want to get snapshots of what's going on in the district. We don't want to be evaluators. We don't want teachers, like the question was asked, the teachers know you were coming. They might have known what day we were going to be there, but they're not uptight about it. They don't, um, most of them, as far as we can tell, don't try to teach a special lesson because we're in there for 20 minutes. We walk out. We come in in the middle of a lesson. We're trying to pick up descriptively what kinds of pedagogy is being used, but we can't pick up the quality of it. And if we become evaluators as opposed to observers, the nature of our role is going to dramatically change and we won't be able to serve you. I think that part of your professional development might be having people from the district who are trusted and skilled coming in to see what some of the problems are. But we wouldn't be able to do that and maintain the kind of data that we're providing you with about what kind of pedagogy is common. We can't do both because they fight against each other. And remember to our observations, um, we are not looking for student off task use. It's not part of our observation instrument. So that data about um, teachers feeling that there is off task inappropriate use all came from the survey results. And teachers were honest with what they said. No There's doubt, also a built-in bias. Um, not that the kids care very much about us. They barely look at us when we come in. But if there's people in the room and a kid was about to play a game or something, they're probably much less likely to do that than if there's no observers. So that's harder to pick up validly. Sure, and I agree that that data would be hard to capture and unrealistic to expect teachers to be able to act adequately capture, not that they're not being honest, but it's very difficult to capture the amount of time students spent off it's task. It's difficult to capture that, but that's a problem with technology integration. And teachers did say loud and clear that it's getting to be an increasing problem. So that would be part of continued professional development, also working with IT to determine how you can prevent that. That's a problem that comes with it. So there's, there's positives and negatives. That's a negative in the whack-a-mole that needs to be pushed down. Okay. So in terms of the scope of your research, you do feel that the 20-minute window gives 
a good um, representation of what it is you were trying to measure? It's a good representation all, um, across hundreds of classrooms. Snapshot, snapshot, snapshot. But it's not going to pick up the quality of a lesson for a given teacher, but nor do we want to do that. Thank you. Mr. Yulfelder. Yeah, can I talk a little more about this off-task use? Um, I've, I've been in several I was in a math class, and um, I saw some kids take the, the project, they were going to whiz right through it, and then they had time. Um, is that what you're talking about, off-task use? Now that the project has been complete, what do they do with their time on their device? I don't think teachers are worrying about that, though. No. So, um, so what exactly are you talking about? Because I can see the difference in, in a high school than in an elementary school in the use of, 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 the, of a device. So did your survey identify what, where, what grade level yes. these teachers? Yes. We, um, we surveyed kindergarten through high school, everyone that's implementing STAT right now, um, in Lighthouse and Phase 2. So we asked each of the teachers to report the frequency that they were seeing off-task or inappropriate use. And then we had them well, provide I mean, is, what is they it, saw. It, is it greater at the high school level than the elementary school level? Yes. You, you have those yeah. you have the statistics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. It is greater at the high school than it is at the elementary, but it is occurring at the elementary level. Well, okay, it's occurring, but that, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Okay. Other questions or comments? Mr. Chair, thank you. I just wanted to uh, thank Drs. Ross and Morrison um, for being our, our external evaluator. So many times I, I think that the perception is that we, we uh, engage with our external um, evaluators and that we only hear uh, the positive. Certainly uh, we are encouraged by the report and it's important for us to have an objective uh, point of view, which is why we've engaged an external uh, evaluator so that we can hear both sides, so that it's not just those things that are going well, but we have an opportunity to work on those things that we that need improvement. And so again, some of those things that we've heard, additional professional development when it comes to those 21st century learning skills. And if you think about what's happened over even the past 10 years, right, our students are not getting one-way information. Uh, many times when we were in school, we had one-way information, right? We could read a book, read an article, you get one-way information. Now there, you know, you have Twitter, you have Facebook, you have social media, you have uh, TV media, you have all kinds of um, streaming media as well. So our students in terms of P21 and our, t P21 and our teachers as well have to um, wrap their heads around how to consume that information and then how to produce information in those varied ways as well. So that's something that the staff, when we get a report such as this, we have to go back and digest how do we then make sure that our curriculum is structured in a way that provides for that and provides that support and built-in PD for our teachers. And when it comes to off-task behaviors, let me just say, as a teacher, there have always been <laughs> off-task behaviors. Uh, so we need, we need to keep a little perspective, but also take this recommendation seriously, that what does that mean in this blended um, type of a learning environment? How do we address off-task behaviors uh, in this type of a blended environment that where we're personalizing instruction? Certainly, we're personalizing that instruction, but when a student has that device, just like when a student had paper pencil, when we had off-task behaviors, we had a certain way of dealing with it then. We'll have to work with our teachers, and I, I believe Ms. Baden talked about the importance of, of time for our teachers to learn and to grow and to perfect their craft as well. So thank you for being that external and uh, evaluator and that objective opinion for us as well. Other comments? Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I wanted to ask a quick question, which was earlier this year the board voted to increase the contract for the Johns Hopkins University study. So my question, is there an additional study coming? If so, when, uh, what will it encompass, or is this the last report? We have two more years. <laughs> <laughs> so this is year three. Um, we do a mid-year report for year four, mid-year report for year five, and then end of year report for year four, and end of year report for year five. Um, with the contract, which I didn't. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> As the board will recall, um, yes, there, there was an addition made to the contract uh, that was made 
in part two to adjust for the additional observation time and also to uh, include student focus groups. So these were things that the board had requested and we then wove them into the contract. Um, and John Hopkins was lovely enough to, to weave those in. But obviously when you're asking them to do additional work then either something comes off the table or you have to, to provide additional funds. Thank you for that explanation. I just wanted to understand how, uh, how that, um, those additional resources were being used. Um, additionally, let me state that as a business professional with a degree in management information systems, um, I understand that technology can be leveraged to increase efficiencies, explore new ways to accomplish tasks and goals, greater evaluation of data for us to make better decisions, um, and also many other benefits. Uh, the questions for this board and administration regarding STAT are many. And we don't expect you to answer the questions, but our questions that we ask of you, your answers will inform our discussions, our um, uh, contemplations of how we can continuously improve for our students. So the questions that we need to ask are, are we accomplishing our goals of education for our students in an effective and efficient and equitable way? Are we providing an effective program of instructions that the teachers can deliver and that will allow our students to thrive? For what we are investing in the money and employee time, and that employee time is a huge part of the investment that we're making. Our teachers' time, our stat teachers' time, our central office time. Um, so that's a huge part of it. And when the teachers talk about having too much on their plate, that's an inefficient use of time if our teachers are overwhelmed and can't um, uh, use these things in the best fashion. Uh, also, given our um, resources and system needs, are we allocating the proper amount? And is what we are spending sustainable? Um, I, you've talked throughout the report and had it up here, the logic model. And I was wondering if you could just explain briefly how that was developed. <clears throat> the logic model? Um, the logic model was developed in um, numerous discussions with the, um, I would say the stat leadership and some of the district leadership in terms of what are you doing with stat? What, what are the inputs? What are the expected outputs? And as we go through a, um, stages of implementation, it's like the logic model isn't very detailed. It's basically saying you provide professional development, different ways of teaching. You provide devices. What do you expect to find? What should happen first? Um, probably the first thing that should happen is teachers' um, attitudes would change. Maybe the way they decorate their classrooms would change. That happened, happened very quickly. Um, next, what would happen is um, probably in the first year, and actually it did happen in the first year through all three cohorts, the way they teach begins to change. Little less direct instruction, teacher-centered, little more student-centered. Um, you get changes in the way students are behaving and interacting in terms of their um, engagement. When do you expect to see that? A little bit the first year, second year. When do you expect student achievement to kick in? Not the second year. Maybe the third year. Should kick in the fourth year because of the quality of instruction engagement are increasing. We should see an uptick. So it's a pretty simple logic model. It's saying, what are you putting in and what do you expect to see about when? It's not granular, because you can get to a more granular level and say we're providing this kind of professional development. Or I'm, I'm going to be quick, because I know probably boring. I'm a no. professor, so we like to talk. <laughs> no. But if you provide a lot of professional development on inquiry, how to teach inquiry, and I'm not saying to do that, you would then have in your logic model that you should see inquiry being taught more. We didn't get to that level. But moving forward, you may want to do a little bit more of that. What is missing in our results that you want to aspire to? And that might direct more granular professional development and expectations for future evaluations. Just food for thought. Thank you for that. Uh, the other thing that is in the report, and correct me if I'm wrong, I saw no analysis of actual student achievement um, through the park test or other metrics. All of the uh, charts uh, were related to growth models, not to actual achievement. So when we are held accountable as a board of education by the Maryland State Department of Education to have our students achieve at a certain level, level on the park test or in other metrics, um, it's concerning to me that that was not in the discussion at all. Park? 
uh, tests weren't available in time for this report. Um, the process at the state level, we don't, we wouldn't have gotten the data in time. We do definitely plan to look at park, and as a matter of fact, we we've taken a view of park from 5,000 feet uh, after this report was released. We just got, we just saw some of that data. Not student level park, but more district level park compared to, and we're in the process of comparing the district trajectory with that of other districts. Here's the problem real quickly. There's no other district in Maryland quite like you. Mm. There's big districts, there's small districts, there's rural districts, there's city districts. They're not quite like you. And the problem is the park from 2015 was contaminated in the district, not your fault, and in, in, in certain places in the state, by some students taking it on paper and some students taking it on computer. And that made a difference because the computer test was harder. And you had a lot or all or a mixed group in 2015. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so it's apples and oranges. But in 2016, you had all taking it on the computer except for special circumstances. And we'll be able to look at your trajectory 2016, 17, compared to districts kind of like you. And we can see how you're doing. But even given the uh, con contamination, as you call it, the mode effect, mm -hmm. um, there are other districts that also had similar situations to ours in terms of mixed uh, scores and so on. So I find it hard uh, to believe that there's no way to analyze the park well, data that, that we have for two years now, and the third year is coming out. That's what you're saying. You're looking at the high level. So again, it's concerning that there's no discussion of actual achievement data. I understand growth. Growth is important, and we are gr glad that we're seeing growth. But again, it's not the metric that we're held accountable to by the by the Maryland State Department of Education for these students to graduate and for us to comply with the law of college and career Actually, ready. I want to clarify a, a couple <laughs> points here because um, while Dr. Ross is talking about some preliminary looks at, at Park. Brown, Mike, yes, thank sir. You. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. <laughs> um, while Dr. Ross is, is uh, mentioning uh, park data, uh, the, the park data that they have is uh, data that has been released previously. The data for the current year is still embargoed, and they do not have that data. <laughs> uh, so that third, you know, when they said they don't have the data, they don't have the data because it's embargoed. It hasn't been released by the state yet. Uh, in regard to uh, growth versus achievement, you actually have both in the report because you reported out achievement on map as well as growth. Yeah, map, but you're, you're talking about the park specifically. But definitely in our list of things that we're going to do as soon as the embargo is listed and we can have the scores is show you graphs and results showing how you compare um, relative to other districts and you can decide how similar they are. But I think the key thing, if, even if another district is a little dissimilar, are you gaining on the state? Are, are you gaining on those other districts? So we will do that. We, that is definitely of interest. We love data. Like, I love to analyze data. <laughs> I get excited. Um, but I, I mean, since writing the report and everything, I did go ahead and pull 2014-15, um, 2015-16 park data for Baltimore County and some as similar as you can make them districts and the state. And so as soon as we get the 2016-17 data, we can add that in. So are we going to have to wait till January or February to understand from you all the park? Or is, when is that going to come to the board? I think as soon as we can have it. As well, soon as we, <laughs> right, as soon as we can yeah. get it and we can try mm -hmm. to inc incorporate that into our, our responses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and the other, um, one of the other issues that I had is um, at what grades and stages of instruction are we seeing uh, the students um, introduced to typing skills and also mastering them in terms of them being effective users of technology? We didn't gather that data directly. Anecdotally, yes, um, when we did our student focus groups. Elementary school students were talking about taking typing classes, appropriate posture. Um, but it was more anecdotal, so we didn't directly measure that. Okay. Is Ms. We White, can have that, that as part of our response, but we do have um, schools that have very deliberate emphasis on typing. And um, Mr. Embrielli, I don't know if you have additional information on that. Is that great, too? I'm sorry, I'm 
sorry, it's very hard to hear. Today, but I think we're but the air conditioning works very well back there. <laughs> so, Uh, we have a, a systemic implementation of edutyping, which is a program that's used at, in all of our elementary schools. All of our elementary schools have multiple different models for how typing is implemented. Each school uh, is given uh, some various options which we can share when we present out the next time. But for example, it could be a, a before school, lunchtime, after school option. It can be during uh, breaks in instruction. When students have finished certain instruction, they could go on to edutyping. It's available through BCPS1. Thank you. Um, the other uh, question I had is um, in the analysis of uh, STAT, how important is the type of the device? Type of what? The type of the device that the students are using. We didn't look at, at the type of device. Um, like, are you talking like uh, the device HB that they have versus a right. Chromebook versus iPad, all of those? Right. We didn't look at that. Okay. Because uh, one of the cons one of the concerns that we need to look at for STAT moving forward is the cost of the devices to the students. Um, currently, we're spending sixteen hundred dollars for a four year lease, um, and that is from a contract that, correct me if I'm wrong, was four years ago or five years ago. And typically, with technology, um, you get more for less as time goes by. Uh, so one of the questions then is this the time frame to consider a new device, especially for our youngest learners, K through two, where um, if we could get a device where I've seen from the same uh, vendor or manufacturer, a $200 tablet that you buy, um, then the savings could be $1,400 per student. And it's important to understand that next year, fiscal year 18, 19, not this school year, because we're in this school year right now, um, we're going to have a t about 23,000 high school students coming online. Uh, if I, nope, excuse me, it's, yeah, over, over 23,000. That might be understated, actually. Um, so if we could save $1,400 per student, that would be $32 million. So um, as we're looking at the whole stat initiative, what's working and, and, and where can we continuously improve. I think that that's something that we need to look at because of uh, all of the needs that we have in our, in our system, especially if we're talking about trying to give teachers more planning time. One way to do that is hire more teachers um, and support staff that can help them. Uh, the other question I have is, um, did you do any evaluation for safety factors? I heard you just mention about elementary school students in, in these focus groups talking about um, proper posture. Did you, uh, is that something that you all evaluated in terms of ergonomics, how much screen time students were actually using, um, and social skill development? No, that was not part of our evaluation. That's not part of your evaluation, okay. Mr. Yulfelder. Well, uh, Ms. Causey, I want to correct you. Um, the devices then cost $1,600. And as I remember, I don't think it was $1,600. I think it was around $1,200. But included in that $1,200 were a lot of things plus the device. The device was not $1,200. It included uh, upgrading the programs uh, as they come out. It included the accounting for lost and broken computers. It, it included um, Insurance for the computers, it, it included a lot of things other than the piece of hardware itself. Any other, any other questions? Well, let's like let's keep the direction here well, to I think that's do, let's let's keep the direction to Dr. Brown uh, and Dr. Morrison. So did I have that right? Ross, Dr. Ross Dr. Brown's Dr. over Dr. there. Ross and Dr. I thought I, I, when I said it, I said there's something wrong here. Dr. Ross and Dr. Morrison. So, are there questions about the study itself? We because we can have our own time to discuss all this about the cost of HP versus whatever. I did have one more question, for, please, for our evaluators. Um, in a number of the charts where you're talking about what um, behaviors are noticed in terms of teacher practice and student uh, learning. Uh, in the difference of the cohorts. Um, do you have recommendations or is, are there recommendations you would make about moving those lessons learned in the Lighthouse schools faster to the other cohorts to decrease the gap of uh, exhibiting a, a great teaching um, 
eight, you know, 78 percent of the time instead of 45 percent of the time. Do you see what I'm saying? How can we take that experience from the Lighthouse schools so that the cohort two, three, four, and five don't have to relearn those lessons every time? Well, I think two part teacher practices are going to take time to change. Um, I think that's natural. Like, I don't, I don't know if more can be done to accelerate them. I definitely think um, from our understanding, there's more collaboration between Lighthouse and Phase 2 schools to try to share lessons learned from the Lighthouse schools. Um, I think focusing on the stat teacher and their PD and then the PD that they're giving to the teachers and lessons learned is probably key if you want to accelerate teacher practices in the new cohorts. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there's no other questions, Dr. Morrison, Dr. Ross, we thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it's, uh, it's important work, and it's important for us to digest it and to, and to move forward based upon it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda, uh, we invite our counsel, Mr. Nussbaum, to come forward to discuss action taken in closed session. Earlier this evening, the board considered an appeal regarding a confidential employee matter in your quasi-judicial capacity. Uh, this matter was heard on the record as there was no request made for oral argument. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the action that the board took in that closed session in that matter, which was a summary affirmance in the hearing examiner number 17-38. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. And the order sitting on the desk for signature. Very good. Thanks. Thank uh, it's now time for a board member comment. And since we don't want to put the pressure on Mr. Young at his first meeting to start this process, we're going to start with the good Mr. Hayden. The good Mr. Hayden, he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it's a shame that m more citizens don't have the opportunity to see what happens here because I think it would be a, a, a great uh, opportunity for them to better understand the challenges that we all have in education uh, for our, our pupils in Baltimore County. And uh, so these conversations are so interesting, and I know we have some people that will listen in in various devices. Uh, but I think anything we can do to encourage more people uh, to be involved, uh, the better uh, our students will be served. Thank you. Mr. Stewart. Um, I'll be brief. Just want to welcome our new board member, Mr. Young, to the fun, to the back and forth, and to thank you for his willingness to join us. Ms. Eaton. I'm good. <laughs> Ms. Causey. Uh, I just also wanted to welcome Mr. Emery Young. Um, he is a dedicated volunteer throughout the uh, entire Baltimore County school system as the um, former PTA County Council President. Uh, also, I think his uh, experience as an engineer is going to be helpful on the board as we uh, continue to improve our CTE programs, as we continue to work on science, technology, engineering, and math opportunities for our students. And I also think it's really um, neat the very relevant experience of a father of students in the system. So welcome aboard. Uh, really look forward to your input. Um, also, I wanted to comment on the board retreat. Uh, it was a wonderful opportunity for the board members uh, to start working collaboratively with our interim superintendent and her chief staff. Um, I'm really looking forward to us building from that and continuing those types of discussions and activities. Um, I also wanted to uh, reiterate what Ms. White has said about the capital construction work session that's going to be August 22, and I encourage stakeholders to email the board uh, with their questions and comments. Um, I'm also looking forward to the board and the system working on school climate and discipline with the input of TABCO and also other stakeholders. So uh, continue to give us your feedback, and we are in the midst of scheduling uh, a hearing around that. So uh, everyone, get your book reports done, you know, get out the list, start buying your school supplies. I am um, excited to uh, look forward to the new teacher orientation and all of those uh, beginning of school activities. Um, I think it's going to be a great year. Thank you. Mr. Yulefelder. Uh Thank you. I just wanted to comment on something that uh, Ms. White said earlier uh, relative to the school supply drive that's undertaken with the uh, Educational Foundation. 
I was hoping this year, uh, since there are many new businesses who have joined the cause, that perhaps at the end of the year or at the end of this period of collecting that we could get some kind of report on how many dollars were actually raised uh, through this program. And it will give us an idea of what kind of goal to set for future years. It's been very, it was very successful in the past, but I know it's more successful this year. Thank you. Ms. Schaefer. Um. I'm okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Birch. Thank you, Ed. I just want to also welcome Emery. Um, Emery, I used to sit there. Um, <laughs> uh, two, two, two things I want to just share with you. Yeah. Um, uh, the first is it's closest to the exit, uh, and so in event of a fire. Uh, the second thing is the red sign next to you. It says, watch your step, buddy. Good luck. <laughs> Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. I know this isn't the uh, meeting for committee updates, but I did want to mention to everybody we are going to have a curriculum meeting on August 17th. I'm actually very excited about that. And as Ms. White said, too, in September we'll hear the staff's response to the STAT um, uh, presentation that we had. So that will also be an interesting uh, meeting uh, to attend. Uh, but but this uh, on the 17th we're going to review um, this focus on literacy and climate that Ms. White is initiating. I think that's interesting. Uh, and look at the calendar over the year and some curriculum pilots. So I think it's going to be an interesting day for all those who want to attend. Thank Very you. Very good. Mrs. Henn. Thank you. So I had an interesting exchange with my seventh grader before the meeting tonight. Um, she always adds a unique perspective on things. She did not want to go to her Taekwondo class tonight. She would rather sit where I am sitting. Mm -hmm. And when she realized that she could not spar at a board meeting, I said, well, you might be surprised. So I, <laughs> coming off the retreat, I was delighted and refreshed that there was no sparring tonight. And I feel like we are starting um, a new start with Ms. White and look forward to positive relations with my board colleagues moving forward, especially our newest colleague, um, Mr. Emery Young. So welcome aboard, Emery. It's great to have you here. So Very good. Thank you. Mr. Young, your first uh, board comment is our last board comment. Which means, being last, I don't have to be as short as other people. <laughs> you should have started with me. Um, no, thank you very much to everybody who welcomed me, um, to everybody who was able to make it out to my um, swearing in. I'd like to say um, thank you to the PTA board members who are in attendance. Um, I've enjoyed working with you guys over the years, learned a lot, and working for, for some of you over the years, uh, but it's been a great experience, and I know a lot of people are kind of wondering where I came from. They haven't heard a lot about me. I would say just ask around, ask people in the county. They will say whatever about me, some good, some bad, you know, so you'll get an opinion. Um, somewhere in between, but the one thing most people will say is that I listen, I ask lots of questions, that way I truly understand what they're saying, what their concerns are, and that I am truly hearing them. And at the end, I hopefully empower them to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Before we adjourn, uh, Ms. White. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I also would like to welcome Mr. Young um, to, to the board and uh, thank you for your commitment to the students of Baltimore County. And thank you to the board members. I've had the pleasure of meeting with mostly everyone uh, individually as well as collectively. And I know that we're making our rounds, but I am uh, really inspired and um, encouraged by the conversations that we've had thus far. And I really am excited about starting this school year. And I know that our teachers and our staff, our uh, administrators are excited to get started as well. For our parents who are out there and students, enjoy the, the final days of summer as we draw down. But thank you so much for your collaboration and for a wonderful board retreat. I do think we had an opportunity to hit the reset button, as we said many, many times. And I'm really looking forward to this upcoming school year. Thank you. Thanks. Our next meeting, August 22nd. Please remember there's an order over there for you to sign. We're adjourned.